superstitious. Um, you've heard a lot of scary things today from other presenters, a lot of terrifying things, a lot of catastrophic things. So I'm your catastrophe for the afternoon. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a catastrophe. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is catastrophes and something very, very scary indeed, something truly terrifying, which is economics. I know most of us like to talk about firmware and hex dumps and hacking and cross-site scripting and methods of bypassing firmware, how malware uh, is classified, identified, what it does. But today, I'm going to try and focus on something a little bit different. If you want to talk about firmware or cooking or other things, we can talk about that later. But right now, catastronomics. So I work um, at this place, the Cambridge Center for Risk Studies. I used to be in the computer science department in Cambridge, uh, but I've been moved over to the business school uh, because I wanted to work with risk people, people who understand risk. Um, we have some big, important people who fund us and some people that we collaborate with. Um, and we have a nice building, right? So what do we do? We do catastrophe modeling. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, I work with a lot of mathematicians, and we work largely in theory. We spend a lot of time discussing hypothetical catastrophes. So we ask questions such as, what would a war in China uh, on trade networks, uh, what would be the impact of a war in China on trade networks, and how would this impact the global economy? And that's just one example, right? We ask these hypotheticals about everything. You could ask if a virus impeded production by 2% on, too many, on 200 oil platforms in the North Sea, what would be the impact, right? And we ask these questions globally. We don't just focus on Europe. We ask about a lot of other countries in the world. And we measure things in GDP at risk. So that's the proportion of the gross domestic product of the country that might be impacted by a particular event. And we try not to think too much about uh, the little events. We try and think about the big events, the earthquakes, the uh, tornadoes, uh, conflicts, uh, these kinds of things. So if you'd like a little overview of the types of threats that we deal with, this is our taxonomy. So these are essentially what I think of as the 12 disciples of risk. Uh, we're all called cats at the center. So like all hackers and internet people, we're obsessed with cats. Um, and the reason for that in this case is short for catastrophes, right? So uh, I work with EcoCat, who focuses on um, ecological catastrophes. I'm part of the tech cat team. I'm known as the cyber cat because I do the cybers, right? You'll have to forgive the cybers. All of my colleagues uh, studied in other fields. They're not computer scientists, so they still say cyber all the time. I'll try and avoid that. But as you can see, we've, we've used this loss estimation and risk estimation in a variety of different ways for a variety of different subjects. And I'm the newest member to the team. And as all of you know, trying to measure cyber risk is really, really difficult. And we're still trying to get a handle on it. So I get a lot of value out of speaking to people who've already made these estimations in other fields and learned how to do it. And of course, we have the last uh, next cat at the end, because we know that we're not the most brilliant people in the world, and we will have made a mistake, and something will have to be added in the future that we haven't discussed. So these are our published scenarios. What, what's a scenario? Why would you write a scenario? Why would you write a fictional scenario about a cyber attack? People often ask me that, and the answer is the real scenarios we don't talk about, right? We talk about the ones that are public, but a lot of times you don't want to make your scenario public. So by making a, a made-up scenario, we can have a discussion around the risks and the threats and what is going on. We can base them off of real scenarios that have happened in the past, but remove the name of the company so that we're not tarnishing a brand or, or being insensitive to the companies that, that might have been involved. And we can make some estimation of the cost of failure of different infrastructures or different businesses or what the impact would be in a systemic way when a business goes down. So 
You may have heard of the uh, business blackout report that was done for Lloyd's. That was a, a blackout scenario based on the US grid. Uh, you may have heard of the other cyber scenario that we did, the Sybil logic bomb, which was based on the idea that um, there was some supply chain uh, subversion of a major database provider, and what would the impact of that be on other people. But you can see that we've also done scenarios on the outbreak of disease. And it turns out some of the mathematics and some of the networks and some of the things we're interested in are the same, even if you're studying cyber, right? So the, the network of ASNs might be a very, very different network uh, in a graph theory sense uh, than the network of Fortune 1000 businesses. But I'm also interested in the effect on Fortune 1000 businesses. So that network turns out to be interesting to me, even if I'm just mapping breaches among the Fortune 1000s. So the, the brilliant thing about Cambridge is um, working with multidisciplinary people, right? I get the opportunity to think bigger and grander and focus on established techniques from academia and bring them uh, to our world. So these are four different network models that we produce for different reports. Uh, I'm sorry they don't look quite so good on the screen. I'm not, a, I'm not very good with, with graphics and things like that. But you can see that one of them is international trading networks. And another is the travel flow of people and goods. That one was particularly important for the uh, pandemic scenario that we did. The one on the bottom left is the business relationship between different types of companies and this one uh, theoretical database provider uh, who may or may not be highlighted in the slides to make it easier to understand. So the last one is a social unrest scenario and the idea of the communications and social media causing people to rally around a single cause and protest in different parts uh, of the world. So you don't have to focus too much on these scenarios or on these images. I just want to show you uh, graphing these networks can teach you something, right? That's the basic, basic point. So has anyone heard of a paper uh, by Rinaldi and a few other people about critical infrastructure interdependencies? Raise your hands. Okay. One or two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. All right. That's the start. Um, it doesn't matter if you haven't read it. I think it's a great paper, not because it tells you a bunch of stuff that you're going to go away and know forever, but it gives you a framework for thinking about the interdependencies of critical infrastructure. And you can disagree with the paper, and that's great. You might have a different framework or a different idea of the linkages, but I'll show you a number of diagrams from this paper and why it formed some of my thinking and try and speak to you about these different couplings, right? Like, how, how does oil and gas couple to electricity? How does water interact with um, health? If you're talking about different sectors of critical infrastructure, what is the impact of one if there is some impact on the other, right? So we like to talk about these dependencies, or I like to think about these dependencies in these different categories, physical, logical, logical cyber, and geographic. And that's uh, how Rinaldi laid them out, right? Or Rinaldi and the other, other researchers, I should say. So physical should make sense to you. It's like uh, electricity is delivered to the water sector to be used in some other place, right? There's a physical good that is being delivered to someone and you're dependent on it, so that makes sense. Logical is their sort of catch-all. If you can't find a way that, that anything else is coupled, but you know that there's a logical coupling, then it's there. So in some sense, that might be considered economic or financial. If the grid is regulated in a certain way and people can do spot pricing, uh, you might have an Enron-style situation. That would be a logical coupling, right? Cyber, which of course is interdependency on a particular infrastructure, uh, a, a computer, computerized infrastructure protocol. Uh, GPS might be an example. Um, synchronization, uh, PMUs might be another example, multiple different uh, entities that function within the grid might depend on the same data from the PMUs, right? And geographic is the last one. This one's very simple. If you have a flood in a substation, uh, then other substations that might be in the same floodplain would be affected by the same flood. So it's just four different ways of coupling these different things. So in general, I think we love to fall in love with the problem in our space. We make the same complaints most of the time. And one of the complaints most researchers have about this subject is, I could solve all these problems if I had real-time access to every asset you have in your plants. And we all think, yeah, we'd like that too, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. And it would open up a whole new set of risks if it did happen, right? 
So as researchers, we need a better idea of doing this. So I was speaking uh, with Dr. Kelly, uh, one of my esteemed colleagues. Um, we have these coffee sessions where we sit around at the risk center and discuss things like, uh, what happened if the moon suddenly disappeared? Yes, it's ridiculous, but can you quantify it on the back of an envelope? Get used to quantifying these things, whatever they might be. So we were talking about whether or not critical, uh, whether electrical sector uh, might go down due to cyber attacks, and then what the effect would be. And he suggested economics. Economics might be a way to study the interdependency of these critical infrastructures. All right, let's move on. Has anyone heard of willingness to accept or willingness to pay? I'm shifting into economics literature here for a moment. No? No one? A little bit? Okay, excellent. So for those who haven't heard of it, willingness to accept is uh, willingness to accept a payment for something that is uh, annoying in your life, and it's a standard way of surveying people to ask their opinions on a service that seems a bit um, hard to define or hard to quantify. Willingness to pay is uh, often used to discuss your willingness to, uh, to pay or be paid uh, to avoid an outage, right? So for a planned outage um, in Sweden, there's a great survey that just came out with a couple thousand people, and it suggests that it's six, uh, 630 sec for one hour, right? I'm not suggesting that people will actually pay any of this money, but that we could indulge ourselves in some economic thinking about what society is willing to accept and what society is willing to pay about the quality of electricity delivery. We also see that they particularly don't like unplanned outages. They don't like outages where they don't know the duration of the outage. So customers are sort of comfortable with planned outages because they can plan for them. Uh, but for unplanned outages, they really don't like it. And they're willing to pay uh, 68 dollars right? Why does this matter to us? Um, well, let's do some back-of-the-envelope calculations, like I was just saying. Imagine the moon disappeared. You know, do the back-of-the-envelope calculation. You learn, you learn cool stuff, like I learned when we did that one. We really did it. Um, that uh, the distance of a body from another body, uh, the effect on the tides increases as the cube of the distance. I'd never learned that before. And it came from this idea of just what would happen if the moon disappeared, right? So same thing here. What would happen if these people were willing to, willing to pay a little bit more money to avoid an outage? So we scale it up. I, I won't read through all this. You can all read. And we don't have to do this just for Sweden. My point is that if you are responsible for a critical infrastructure budget, you should be reading some of this literature, particularly around different critical infrastructures. And you should be thinking about how that impacts the amount of money that you can devote to these tasks. That's all. Simple concept, really. So where do we scale that? How do you do loss estimation? If you want to sit down and think, think about the impact of the loss of water uh, to the rest of the economy for four hours in this tiny region, or for the entire country um, for two days, uh, you're going to end up having these discussions about whether or not it's likely, whether or not it can happen, uh, how the water is distributed, how this system is decoupled from that system and it can only happen to this city at that time, these kinds of things. And that's great. But we still want to do the loss estimation. We want to have some measure. Now, I don't particularly trust economics. Uh, I don't trust any metric that is in only one dimension, but the economics is a good start, right? Um, sometimes you'd like to measure things in terms of the amount of people who are disrupted from work or the amount of people who die because it's cold and it's winter and there's no heating. Um, but let's just start with economics for now, right? So one of the things you want to talk about is direct economic impact versus indirect. And you want to think about things like, what is the loss of revenue to the electric sector if there's an electricity outage in this portion of the country, which contains this portion of the population? Another thing you want to do is think about the secondary impacts to other companies, the knock-on companies, right? So if you work in a critical infrastructure, then your budget for cybersecurity comes from that direct loss to some degree. Um, the company wants to protect its revenues from its customers. That's not the same as the indirect loss to the citizenry if they don't have access to a service. So let's start talking about measuring both of those values and comparing them and figuring out where this is going wrong and where government can help private industry and private industry can help citizens and these sorts of things. Okay, so we use the Oxford economics model. And this is a standard counterfactual risk stress testing uh, method. 
It is, at the moment, mostly expert opinion, but we're trying to make that better, right? And the best way to do that is to create rough metrics in a land of no metrics at all. So what does it look like? It looks like this. This is an estimation for power outage in uh, the US. Uh, there's some crazy speculation in here because the insurers are worried about some things. Um, but these are three different variants of the same scenario, basically. So if there's a cyber attack and a large portion of the Northeast uh, power grid uh, goes down, or generation actually is, is impacted for a couple days, uh, or up to two weeks, these are the costs, right? And the costs are uh, small. You see up at the top for the power generation companies. Um, they're not particularly high, but the liability could be much higher if the courts suddenly start finding uh, in favor of people who delivered insecure software. Companies that lose power are impacted more heavily uh, than the companies that sell power to some degree, economically, right? And homeowners particularly are hit, but they're not the greatest purchasers of electricity, right? So usually when we're doing critical infrastructure for electricity, we're focused on protecting the industrial customers because they provide more money. But they're also the ones who buy backup generation capacity and multi-source their generation or their, uh, you know, their electricity. So if we're protecting citizenry, it's different than just the economics. However, this is what that looks like, right? And that assumes that the economy recovers in a sort of steady state uh, which may or may not be true, and we can have discussions about that. But the point is, this generates discussions in your company about what you do for reliability and what you do for security and what your budget could be and what government's responsibility for some of that budget is and what private industry's responsibility is and what the general citizenry's uh, responsibility is. All right, so let's get into some great diagrams. This is taken from Rinaldi's paper. Uh, I think the next few diagrams that I have for you will be in this format. It's a conceptual map, right? It's not very quantifiable. So what we'd like to do is get quantifiable about this. I'd like to get towards critical national infrastructure more as a science and less as hand-wavy. Electricity is the core of all other critical infrastructure. I think we overestimate that. I'd like to see some evidence of that. Yes, it's very, very important, but it's not the core, right? A lot of other industries have backup uh, capacity or generation ability, at least for a couple hours, if not weeks, right? The other thing is that you know, the water sector often uh, does its own generation to handle uh, itself. And this is different from country to country. It's not the same in every country. So how do we map that? How do we get a sense of how coupled these different things are? And I think this, this categorization up above here captures that, right? Not all types of failure are the same. Some are common cause, some are cascading failure. Uh, escalating failures are very different. They behave differently in scale-free networks than they do in networks that are not scale-free. Um, the infrastructure characteristics, you know, is the organization good at security or bad at security? Are they good at interdependency or independency? Uh, are they, you know, economically coupled or are they coupled in a regulatory sense? A great way to take down a power station, for example, is uh, affecting some of the um, data that is reported to the regulator. If you can't report to the regulator, what do you have to do? Report that you can't report and then you get in trouble, and then you're dealing with a legal situation. Yeah, it might not turn the electricity off, but it's a nightmare for that individual company. Okay, so how circular is dependency, and could we measure that? Is interdependency of electric power, um, well, this goes back to what I was saying, right? Electricity is the underpinning of everything. I think we think that because we can't store it very well. If that changes, if we have a lot of storage in the network, it'll be quite different. But right now, we can't store a lot of electricity very easily unless you, know, you happen to be Norway and you put it all in reservoirs. But for the most part, most other countries, they, they don't have this luxury. This is a dependency map, mental map, of electric, electric power's dependency on other infrastructures. Which I think is important because, again, we say that everything else is dependent on electric, but we forget that we're dependent on trains to provide the coal for the coal-powered station. Or if you're a hydroelectric plant, you're dependent on not having a drought, right? There are dependencies for electric power on other things. So are we caught in this circle where everything's interdependent on itself and we're in this mess? No, we'd like to measure it. And it's different for different countries. So can we estimate nth order effects? Imagine one critical infrastructure, not even the whole thing, just one piece of it, 
is gone for a short period of time, eight hours, six hours, two hours, can we estimate what the other effects would be? What are the second order effects? So if I take electricity out of this region, uh, it's not being delivered or it can't be delivered or whatever, what is the impact to that on emergency services? What is the impact to the health service for a period of time? What is the impact to agriculture? And is that measurable? And if there is an impact to the health service, does that have another impact on the number of people who can get to work in transport? And does that have an impact on the number of people who can get to work in other sectors? Can we estimate this? Can we measure this? It's one thing to talk about it, but can we measure it in some sense? Can we measure any of this, right? So let's talk about Rinaldi's four dimensions. Like I said, I trust metrics that are in multiple dimensions because they're capturing at least two different views of the world. So geographical, this is the easiest one to automate. If you have any sort of data that tells you the latitude and longitude of something, like, I don't know, in Showdown, you know, by a margin of error, it's estimating the location of something, then you might be able to say, are these two things in the same area? And I'm worried about a flood. So I guess this last point at the bottom is really important. Think about what your threat is, such as, say, for example, an explosion. And you can say, OK, I'm only talking about explosions from standard uh, chemical explosives. I'm not talking about uh, you know, any fission or anything. right? Then I'm only interested in the blast radius of this. And then you can go around your data set and see whether they are in the same blast radius. Or you can see whether in they're in the same floodplain or you can see whether their likelihood of being hit by the same forest fire is similar. So we know that we can sort of estimate geographic interdependency. We can't be certain they're dependent or independent, but we can make some fuzzy metric for it. Physical is the one that worries us, right? It's knowable, but it's very, very difficult to automate. How would you automate your knowledge of how uh, the water sector is dependent on um, the chemical sector, just as an example. Difficult. But fuel and energy and inputs to critical infrastructures are an easy win. You can sort of go to the different sectors and say, you know, what are your fuel supplies in electricity and how much of which ones do you use? You can sort of begin to estimate that, right? It tends to be specific to an industry. So going around visiting every industry and figuring this out, not so easy. But it is different for different countries as well. Right. Cyber. Now, this one is interesting because we can probe the public internet. So if you do have some co-location in an ASN, for example, between two different industries, then you have some sense. Now, they might be dual-homed in multiple ASNs, which is great, but you can go and ask them that. Do they all require GPS? Do they all require internet or DNS? I mean, I'm sure DNS wouldn't be considered a critical infrastructure, right? But we all rely on it. Does patching count in some sense as, a, as an interdependency? Do you rely on those patches? I don't think you do because, you know, the story goes that you don't ever install them, right? Just out of curiosity, how many people installed uh, firmware this year on their home routers? OK. How about on the switches in your networks at work? Wow, two, three. Wow, OK. Doesn't happen that often, right? The availability window is very, very tight, so I understand. But. OK, how do we measure this, uh, this patching, right? How do we measure this cyber dependency on patching um, or on the generation of patches, right? Well, a patch doesn't matter if a vulnerability is never uh, exploited uh, against the system. But we'd still like to be certain that in the future it won't work. So I have no idea how we proxy this. I know you expect people to get up on a stage and be awesome and arrogant and give you all the answers, but I'm not that guy. I actually have <laughs> no idea how we're going to proxy this information. Where would I go to to get a useful measure of cyber interdependency of critical infrastructures? I don't know. Hopefully, that's a good question for the audience, because I know that they'll be sending questions to me. Some of them will probably be troll questions. I'll check those in a minute. Um, but the, the, you know, the questions flow both ways. So this is my question to you. Where would you get uh, proxy data for cyber interdependency of critical infrastructure? 
logical covers anything other than phi, psi, or geo, right? So a classic example is the market effects that I mentioned earlier, such as Enron. So as a, as a catch-all, it's difficult to automate this with any metrics, and maybe we should throw this one out and invent a new one. Um, but we think that our input-output tables represent this to some degree. And most nations in the world publish input-output tables for the economics of different sectors in the country. So Sweden does that. I have a little bit of a challenge in reclassifying the input-output tables into critical national infrastructure sectors. And this turns out to be a pain because different countries classify their critical national infrastructure differently. So every time I do this, I have to create whole new MATLAB uh, code to run across matrices and aggregate up and do all this other stuff that you don't particularly care about, and that's fine. But the point is you have to do it for different countries. And I wanted to do it for Finland and Norway as well, and I, um, I had trouble because I couldn't find a list of Finnish critical national infrastructure that is uh, an accepted standard. So if you happen to know what that is, I'd love to know, and uh, I can try and do some more work on that. But enough waffling. Let's have a look at what that tells us, right? So first of all, this is not an entire input-output table. I've left out the, the sectors or the numbered, uh, the inputs and outputs that don't fit into a critical national infrastructure. But the ones that are considered critical infrastructure are up there. I'm sorry about the coloring. It's very difficult to get this graph viewable uh, to this, this audience uh, with all of these different sectors. It's usually easier if you remove some of the sectors. But this is very different than the, the one I did for the UK that I presented uh, at S4 um, in uh, last year. Uh, it's different than the UK and it's different than the US, right? So the coupling of the economics of countries and their critical infrastructure sectors um, is different in different countries. It shouldn't be much of a surprise, but it does turn out to be important. So oil and gas and electricity are kind of interestingly coupled in the, in the, in the UK. But here you can see that municipal services and trade and industry are quite highly coupled. You'll also notice, I, I don't have a laser pointer, so unfortunately I can't really highlight it, but you see how there's this big, uh, like almost shadow, like this pink shadow around municipal services? That's its reliance on itself uh, economically. It generates a lot of money inside its sector. So they spend a lot of money amongst themselves. And you can see that trade and industry do the same thing. Um, so now remember this is solely economic. This is not necessarily a good proxy for how physically interdependent they are. But it is in the sense that they buy and sell things uh, from and to each other. And I think this generates some interesting questions about how you classify critical national infrastructure. Could we move towards that being a little bit more of a science? My friend once said, CNI, critical national infrastructure, is like porn. You know it when you see it. When you stand in this giant facility, you think, yeah, the country depends on this. Could we do better than that? Could we find some metrics for why something would be on the list? If you were making a list of critical infrastructure in your country, what would be the rule for adding or subtracting elements from the list? And people say, why would you ever subtract something from the list? Well, because you don't want to be spending money on things that are no longer relevant, right? At one point in time, the pager networks of the world might be considered critical national infrastructure. Today, they might still be critical infrastructure, but they might be further down the list, right? And what are, are the rules different per sector if you're classifying critical national infrastructure in some way? I think that's an interesting question. I don't have the answer, but hopefully we can discuss it, discuss it today. One of the other things that we don't like are um, that cost functions are lumpy. When we're understanding these couplings and these relationships, we understand that many of the functions are nonlinear, right? Has anyone heard of the Lawton damage function? No? Economics. That's right. Like I said, it's going to be a scary talk about economics. I'm sorry. I'll get to the insurance soon, and we can move away from this. But, but basically, you have these lost load calculations, and they tend to be uh, sort of linear, uh, but we know they're not linear, right? The first day of a power outage, a bunch of people, well, uh, 24 hours after the power outage, a bunch of people are losing uh, goods in their freezers, right? So, like, the initial cost of the outage might be here, and then it might go up for a period of time and down again. We know it's not a linear function. So we have trouble estimating that, but we're doing the best. 
we do know that things matter, like when the outage happens, the frequency of reoccurrence, the time of day, the day of week, all of these are parameters that have to go into your measurement of value of lost load. Now, I'm not particularly a fan of value of lost load, but many of you use it, and I won't criticize that. At least you're using something. Lot and damage function was what we used in the US. So this was uh, the impact to society of a power outage in, in the US. Um, and as you can see, commercial and industrial customers are completely skewed in this analysis because they pay more money uh, for, this, for the service, in a sense. And I don't just mean directly. Like, they value the service higher than individuals and houses. Many, many individual citizens just think electricity should come for free, and, you know, it doesn't take any engineering to keep it up, which is ridiculous. I try and change their mind, but, you know, it's a long conversation. So this report was created for Lloyd's, which is an insurance market uh, in the UK. And they're responsible for about 10% of the insurance worldwide. And that's all insurance. But now I'm going to talk to you about some really scary stuff, which is cyber insurance. And it's scary to me, right? I'm more comfortable on a command line with a hex DOM trying to figure out ways to uh, bypass you know, checksums or cryptographic signing and, and breaking stuff. I like breaking stuff. I'm from QA originally, and I just I have that mindset where it's, you just enumerate all the bad things and people will fix them and it'll be fine. Um, I'm not used to insurance, and insurers kind of scare me a little bit, but I'm getting used to them. And one of the things that's brilliant is that you get to talk to them about how they created new forms of insurance historically. So I got an amazing lesson in how the industry created insurance for piracy. They insured people for piracy for, well, they still do, actually. You know, Piracy never went away, just like hacking. It's still there, and they still insure against it, but they can handle the risk and measure the risk and deal with it in some way. And insuring man-made perils is very, very different than insuring against fire. Fire has physical limits. Hackers keep finding new ways to do stuff, right? So this is a point that you can insure things that even people innovate. And it's nice to think on these scales. Like, in 100 years' time, will insurance solve any of our problems? Will it solve a few problems and leave us a bunch of really complicated ones, but it'll solve, hopefully, maybe the easy ones? I don't know. Let's discuss that. So is cyber risk insurable in an economic sense? Can you even get some sense of what you would insure if you ran a plan, uh, whether or not you think they'll pay out? I'll address the myths of cybersecurity in, a, in another slide. Um, but the insurers are seeing demand from corporate clients for cyber insurance cover. Now, I want to clarify, because I'm speaking to OT and ICS people. There's only two vendors that I know of today that sell OT insurance, but they will sell you OT insurance. So you can go and see Aegis, and you can go and see AIG, and you can insure your plant against catastrophic damage from cyber attack. There's plenty of other insurers, 35 or something out there, that are selling cyber insurance that is not OT focused, right? So these people are selling breach insurance, DDoS insurance, um, insurance against leaks, insurance against brand reputation, uh, directors and officers insurance, um, event cancellation insurance. But they do sell cyber insurance. And the question is, can we get a sense of this liability over time? So the insurers discovered that they were silent on cyber losses, and they wanted to do more, uh, more about it. So they do think that, that it's an insurable peril. They do think that they can get a handle of it. Uh, the question is, how much capital do they need to put in the, bank, in the bank to handle these risks? So that's what they're concerned about. Uh, and of course, if you get breached and you want to go back and buy more insurance, they're going to charge you more money. And we better get used to that. And then they're going to have requirements for what you will do in your facilities to uh, resist uh, these things in the future. So these are the reasons I encounter that people think cyber insurance will fail. They think they won't pay out. Uh, they won't pay out sometimes. They'll find somebody else in fault. But as a general rule, they will pay out because it's their business model. If they don't pay out, you don't buy cyber insurance, and they go out of business. So most of the time, they're going to pay out. And I've seen them pay out on things that I would have challenged, right? But they just say, yep, we're happy. We'll write the check, right? This is within our business model of how much money we lose per year. Don't care. So they have to pay out sometimes. They have to pay out most of the time. Uh, but exclusions are part of that game. So they make exclusions like, oh, if it's attributed to be this, uh, this particular group, uh, we're not paying out. I don't know about you, but I think that might be a loophole that, <laughs> that you might use to your advantage. Uh, you don't see a lot of attribution out there, right? 
the potential loss of critical infrastructure failure is unlimited. So there's no way you can insure it, is another thing that I hear people froth at the mouth and say. Well, insurers, they do put limits on it. If you want unlimited insurance, you're going to pay for it. But a lot of times, they'll say the limit is this. And they'll sell insurance in towers. Like, this insurer will sell you up to the first 100 million. The next one will say, I'm only selling you, selling you insurance for 100 million to 500 million, right? And they build these towers, right? So even though the potential loss might be unlimited in one sense, it doesn't matter. And you might argue that they don't understand the technology, but they don't have to. They hire you. They're going to hire you to do this kind of work. So these are the other reasons. People say it's unquantifiable, that there's an information asymmetry. Um, the point here is it doesn't matter whether insurance succeeds or fails. We need the risk metrics to understand the problem. So if insurance fails, if you think you can do a better job with your in-house security team, you'd be using the same metrics as you would if you were an insurer. So we don't really care if insurance succeeds or fails. What we care is that we get metrics and we understand the risk in terms of cyber and in terms of hacking. So what good can come of this? Security is usually a market failure. Insurance makes a market for good security, I hope, in the long run. Uh, in the protocol, in the device, in the network, in the organization. If you want to understand that process, read the history of the underwriters' laboratories and the effects they had on fire safety. Um, true story, average cost of a breach is lower, surprise, if you have a CSO and if you have a disaster recovery and breach response plan. So your insurance will cost less money. And I'm not saying they will sell it to you for less. I'm saying they know statistically that it will cost them less if you have a CSO and you have a disaster recovery plan. That's going to have a market effect. You're going to be asked to have a CSO. You're going to be asked to have a disaster recovery plan. Don't you wish everyone had these things? I do, personally. So cyber insurance uh, will improve security of simple things. Default, passwords, hard-coded keys, vendors won't fix, um, these kinds of things. It can't improve the security of your organization. Only you can do that, right? But they will ask you questions about these things. And your incident history and your security posture will matter to the purchasing of this insurance. So this is what a cyber catastrophe looks like from our point of view. Um, I realize I'm running really short on time, so I'll just whip through these slides. You sure? Okay. So this is just a mental model. You don't need to focus on this too much. The idea is that we don't consider it a catastrophe in the center if it doesn't affect a lot of companies and uh, the severity of the loss isn't high. So we're not as interested in breach insurance as we are on catastroph catastrophic failure. So if you want to talk to us about writing scenarios for catastrophes or studying the loss of catastrophes, this is what we're interested in. We try and understand the cyber economy. Um, by that, I'm sorry for using the word cyber, but what I mean is the economy that is dependent on uh, computers and networks, right? What does that look like? It looks like this. Um, this is a force-directed graph. I know you're a very intelligent audience, so you know what that means. Basically, the strength of the links between these different nodes pulls them together. So you get clustering of different groups of companies. Does anyone see any patterns in here? Uh, I, I guess I'm short on time, so I won't ask. The blue ones, they stand out, right? Because they don't cluster. Those are banks. The reason they don't cluster is because they don't depend on other people within their own industry for trade. They depend on businesses of other types. So they tend to spread out and be related to all sorts of different industries. So if you want to do sectorialization and you want to study critical infrastructure sectors, you can now group them according to their trade relationships in this way. Now, again, this isn't their relationships in terms of uh, their networks, but it is another type of network that matters to the cost of failure. So we came up with this idea of SITEs, uh, which are basically um, critical providers of services to different organizations. Now, they might not be business critical to you, but they affect a lot of other different groups of people. So do I love hacking? Yes. Will I be doing it downstairs tomorrow? Yes, I will. However, it's time to grow up and quant as well. Uh, and these risk management techniques apply to a variety of different things, right? So I'd like to say thank you to a couple of people. I'll leave that up, and uh, I guess I'll finally look at some of these questions. Thank you. Good catch up there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. A bit different so. from the others. Yes. And it warms my heart to know that 
Being a CSO is useful. Yes. <laughs> Having a disaster recovery plan is useful. Indeed. Great. Yep. So um, I will talk to my CEO okay. about my salary. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I like to have that effect. Okay. So we have a lot of uh, interesting questions here. Um, so I start with one. Are big companies in general willing to pay for risk analysis or risk management? What is your opinion on that? Uh, the in, if, do we mean, uh, I guess I can't ask a question back. I'm going to assume that you mean uh, cyber only, right? So we, we only mean... Let's uh, assume that, yeah. Okay, so then, yes, they are willing to pay uh, for risk management techniques. Uh, utilities are willing to pay for that as well, particularly the insurers. Mm -hmm. They want to not pay out money at scale. They don't care that they pay money out. They just don't want to pay it out multiple times for the same event, and they don't want to pay it out in large amounts over and over and over again. So they need to understand the ratio of frequency and severity of different types of attacks. And that's why OT insurance is hard, because they don't have a history of attacks. Well, it sounds reasonable. I mean, yeah. so private sector is financially focused. So wouldn't it make sense for them to avoid risk by getting insurance? And that is more or less yes? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> but we don't want them to only do that, right? Like mm -hmm. insurance can be a tool, particularly if you're transitioning a plant from a very insecure state to a more secure state, or you have a more secure plant, but you have one that you just know is not gonna get fixed in the next five years, use insurance there, use it as a tool. But you shouldn't use it instead of doing security, and that'll bite you in the end, because next year, you'll end up paying twice uh, for the insurance and for the security program anyway, so. Yeah, okay, but I mean, being risk-based in your work mm -hmm. means that you are aware of what you need to do, so. Making mistake once mm -hmm. is okay, but twice is a disaster. Yeah, precisely. Okay, good. So, how should be responsible for the third-party consequences? In Sweden, right now, we are talking a lot about cloud mm -hmm. services, mm -hmm. so. and it seems like people who are signing a contract with a cloud service vendor say, "I'm, I got lost of this problem. I mm -hmm. don't have to, you know, bother mm -hmm. anymore." Mm -hmm. Uh, so, who is the responsible person, in your opinion? Well, or yeah, the act. Yeah, actor, if we take the part. if we take the cloud example, mm. you're signing away, uh, you know, the management of a bunch of your devices, mm -hmm. and they're adopting the risk, but your data is still at risk. So you can't offshore all of the risk. If they get hacked, you're affected, <laughs> and they have no liability. I think that's crazy. I think the end user license agreement is the greatest risk transfer in the history of the world. Yeah, I could agree to that. <laughs> what is the best real life catastrophe that is used to compare your models against for cyber? Ah, okay. So for the 2003 power outage, I guess, uh, yeah, we'll do cyber, we'll do cyber. So 2003 power outage, we used as a model um, for the effects of the cyber attack that we were looking for, and we measured that in terawatt hours. So once we had an understanding of terawatt hours, the reason we did that is a power outage is different uh, per number of people per region. So it was the easiest metrics we could find that was multidimensional was terawatt hours lost. And so once we had a level of what a one in 100 year, or one in 50 year, one in 100 year, and one in 200 year power outage looked like in terms of terawatt hours, then we scaled our attack to be that because our attack scenarios are supposed to be one in 50 year, one in 100 year, one in 200 year return periods. Our insurers demand that kind of level of rigor. Okay, wow. And of course we can't do that for cyber because we don't have 200 years of attacks, right? So you play this trick where you base it off the effect instead of the frequency and likelihood of the attack. Yeah, right. and all those reports that you had the cover on on your mm -hmm. slide, they're available Mm -hmm. from your website. You can right. use those to practice your disaster recovery to a variety of different scenarios. Very good advice. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>